them in as as they come in over the course of the evening. But I'll I'll get us started. We're really happy you're all here tonight uh, on a Wednesday in December for the Big Texas Read. My name is Blake Kimsey. I'm the executive director of Writing Workshops Dallas, and together with David Samuel Levinson and Alexander Vandekamp from Gemini Inc. We bring you the Big Texas Read uh, every month. Uh, we're really excited about our guests tonight. And um, we do always like to thank our bookstores. We like to thank uh, Interbang Books up here in Dallas to Twig Bookshop down in San Antonio, the University of Texas San Antonio Library System, and also Lone Star Literary for always helping uh, us spread the word. So thank you for being here. Uh, David will introduce our guests tonight and I'll let Alexandra say just a few words about um, Jim and I Inc. No, just great to be here. It's great to be collaborating with Blake and Dallas and of course, David as well. This began as a pandemic idea, this pandemic, which is kind of leaving, kind of not. <laughs> um, but it definitely has grown to have legs of its own. And we just love doing this virtual book club every month. We reach, you know, readers from all over the state and we're able to, you know, feature wonderful authors like Sergio Troncoso tonight and have these great guest moderators like Cliff kind of guiding these really interesting conversations. Um, just so you know, these are recorded. You can always go to the Gemini YouTube channel or to Blake's website and watch it again or share this reading after tonight with anyone else who you think would enjoy it. But we are San Antonio's Writing Arts Center and we teach the craft of writing to people of all skill levels so they can bring their stories to life. And we love finding out about how stories come to life and just experiencing great stories. So that's what tonight's all about. Leave comments in the chat. We do have an audience Q&A at the end. We'll read your question or even unmute you so you can read it yourself to Sergio and you know have a nice um, dialogue with him. And just thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, I'm gonna introduce Cliff, our moderator first, and then I will introduce our guest star. Um, Cliff Hutter. Do you really want me to say this? Flunked out of law school in 1991? <laughs> okay, well, uh, but received an MFA in fiction writing from the U University of Houston in 1995. He has been an archeological laborer, a film and video editor, a photographer, air compressor mechanic, electrical lineman, and educator. No, this is not what I want you to read. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, let me revise as I go. In addition to articles on regional and American literature, his short stories have appeared in several journals, including Alaska Quarterly Review, the Kenyon Review, and the M Missouri Review. His work has received the Bartleme and Missioner Awards, the Peden Prize, and the Short Story Award from the Texas Institute of Letters. His novella, Splinterville, which I have read and loved and everyone should read, won the 2007 Texas Review Fiction Award, and his novel, Pretty Enough for You, is forthcoming. This is an old bio, Cliff. Uh, and his novel, <laughs> Pretty Enough for You, has been out for several years. And uh, he has a new novel that I also read that I loved. Um, Cliff, what's the title? Oh, did we come up with a, did you come up with a title? No, not yet. Okay. Um, it's amazing. It's, 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 yeah, uh, it's really fantastic. Uh, he teaches English at Lone Star College, Montgomery and Conroe, Texas, where he lives with his wife, and son, um, and he received a PhD in English at Texas A&M University, and he's our mo guest moderator. And now I will introduce Sergio. Sergio Troncoso is most recently the author of A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son, uh, which Luis, Luis Alberto Llorea praised as a world-class collection. Troncoso also edited the 2021 anthology Nepantla Familias, an anthology of Mexican-American literature on families in between worlds, which received a starred review from Kirkus Reviews. The author of eight books, he has won the K. Catarula Award for Best Short Story, Premio Aslan Literary Prize, International Latino Book Award for Best Collection of Short Stories, Southwest Book Award, Bronze Award for Essays from Forward Reviews, and the Silver and Bronze Awards for Multicultural Adult Fiction from Forward Reviews. Troncoso has served as a judge for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the New Letters Literary Awards in the essay category. His work has recently appeared in the Texas Highways, Houston Chronicle, CNN Opinion, New Letters, Yale Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, and Texas Monthly Magazine. He teaches fiction and nonfiction at the Yale Writers Workshop, 
A Fulbright Scholar, Troncoso is president of the Texas Institute of Letters, and we welcome you both tonight. Take it away, Cliff. Okay, thank you. And thanks a lot, Alexander and Blake and David for asking me to do something I just always love to do, which is talk to Sergio about his work. And uh, I, I know that he is full of all kinds of uh, wisdom and advice on the pro writing process and uh, life and letters here in the United States. And um, Sergio, these, these kick off in different ways I've noticed. We, we, this is our, our book for this evening, uh, Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son. And we'd like to hear some from this, but, and I, I mean this as a compliment, I, I consider this a peculiar kind of story collection. Uh, it, kind of unique. So I was wondering if quickly first you could kind of tell us your conception of the book and a, and a little bit about yourself as a, as a native of Isleta who has gone on to other things. Well, I guess I'll start a little bit about myself and then I'll keep blabbing. I'll, you know, just sort of raise your hand or something and I'll go into the book. Um, I grew up in Isleta, which is on the outskirts of El Paso, uh, Texas. And Isleta at that time was a uh, colonia, a shanty town, basically. And we didn't have uh, electricity for the first couple of years. And we had an, an outhouse, which we had to dig out ourselves. And, and we were probably a fifth of a mile from the border. And it was on the outskirts of El Paso desert. Uh, I describe it often as um, sort of Tom Sawyer-ish kind of living, but everybody's Mexican in, in this sort of version of Huckleberry Finn and, and Tom Sawyer. And, uh, and so from there, really not knowing what the hell I was doing. Um, I mean, I was a good writer and the people always ask me who were my early influences. I think I, I always pointed to, um, on the one side was my Grand, maternal grandmother, who was a great oral storyteller. And, uh, and she lived in downtown El Paso in a tenement and grew up, uh, her family fought with Francisco Villa, with Pancho Villa. Two of her uncles died uh, and her father uh, fought uh, with the El División del Norte. So she would tell these gory, exciting stories about being a teenager in the, uh, during the revolution. And and she would just be smoking her cigarette and drinking her coffee. And they would go on till one or two in the morning. So, so on weekends, I would actually spend time with her listening to these stories. And, and I learned a lot about oral storytelling from her. And, and, and by the way, she had a group of about 10 people, almost always from the tenement listening to these stories. So it was an audience and she, you know, she was very unfiltered in, in what she would tell and I was the youngest by far everyone there was probably over 70 and then from my on the other side maybe my more intellectual side I don't know if you want to call it that my um, paternal grandfather Santiago Troncoso uh, go to uh, so I'm going to type I'm going to type his name um, so that people can look it up but if you go to google right now and you type in Santiago Troncoso, you'll see that there's a big boulevard in Juarez named after Santiago Troncoso. And that's my grandfather. So he was editor and publisher of El Dia, first daily newspaper in Juarez in the 1920s and 30s. And he was a sort of rabble rousing Woodward Bernstein of his era that would write anti-government corruption articles and um, he was thrown in jail 28 times. His print shop was firebombed, I think, three times. I mean, today they would have just shot him dead. None of this sort of soft violence. And when he retired in El Paso in the fifth, well, 50s or so, actually the McCarthyites dragged him before U.S. federal court in El Paso because they thought he was a commie, um, communist. Um, you know, he was, he was head of, because of, he, of his publishing, he was head of the sindicato, the, you know, in Juarez of, of publishers, the union of publishers. 
And so anyway, so he has sort of a storied history fighting for um, freedom of the press. But, but he told me as a teenager when I was interested in writing and I was editor of my high school newspaper, he said, don't become a writer because if you tell the truth, people will hate you forever. And, and of course I ignored him, but, but that was his, <laughs> that was his, his, his viewpoint. And, and th so let me just briefly chat about, I don't want to blab too much, but people can always ask me about, about the, uh, about my background, but the, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this book. Cause it is a book that on the face of it is just a short story collection, but it's so much more, but you have to be a very astute reader and a very careful reader. And the, the first thing to, to notice is that when you look at the table of contents, don't just go blow by the table of contents. They're actually 13 stories that are grouped in twos and threes. And there's the reason for this grouping. Um, I am, as you will see at the very beginning, a big fan of Virginia Woolf and Friedrich Nietzsche. I studied philosophy at Yale and actually read um, many of these German philosophers and Thomas Mann, et cetera, in the original in German. I learned German later in school. And so I'm heavily into perspectivism. So I wanted to take the short story form and use it in a way that you can only do this in, the, in this form and not, for example, in a novel, which is characters would appear in one story. For example, the first grouping is, is uh, Rosary on the Border and New Englander. And so David Calderon appears in one story from one angle and one perspective, and it's the same character and then reappears in the next story from a different angle and in a different perspective. Um, and this continues on uh, in the collection and it starts with realistic stories at the beginning. And as you read through the collection, it takes you to a surrealistic or magical realistic uh, metaphysical uh, stories, so to speak. But it's always playing with perspective and perspectivism and challenging the reader to think, well, do I really know this character that I just encountered in this story? And now I'm encountering her or him again in this second story. And he seems a little different from, from what I thought, or he seems vastly different from what I thought. And, and, and what, I'm, what I'm really trying to argue for is that we are many different selves. If you ask my wife who I am, she'll give you a version. If you ask Cliff Hutter who I am, he might give you a version. If you ask my children who I am, uh, they may have another version. If, if you asked me when I was 25 who I was, very different from who I am now. And so I, I think that's part of the exploration into identity and perspectivism that I wanted to use a short story form to, to show. And at a certain point, you'll see as well that the reader, him or herself, becomes a character in the storytelling. Toward the penultimate story, um, there is a, 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 a researcher that's, that's, that's going after a subject that they're trying to uncover from the Mexican Revolution. And the reader in this, in this case um, is bringing to life that character simply by the act of reading. And, and that, again, I'm, I'm, tr I'm asking the reader to ask him or herself, what is it that you bring to any reading from any collection that uh, allows you to bring a character to life or that we, you will say, I know that character, I'm not even gonna think about this character. I'm already making assumptions about this character because of my own predispositions and, and perspectives. So it is really challenging the reader to look at perspectivism in many different ways, not just in the form of the stories, but within the characters of the stories. And let me put out a challenge to all of you right now. I put in puzzles in this book, puzzles that I will believe no one will answer for 10 years. Um, so you have to read closely <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm gonna, be quiet in a second. I mean, I, I, I did a graduate degree in philosophy at Yale, and we would spend probably three months um, reading Aristotle's physics 
and reading maybe two or three paragraphs in those three months to understand really what Aristotle was trying to do in that very short um, space. People don't read that way anymore. People are used to Twitter and, and the internet and you breathe right through it and the TV and the movies have kind of you know, made us stupid really. And, and so I'm challenging the reader to, to come back to paying attention to what uh, writers are doing on the page and, and, and the depth that I hope is there. In fact, I know it's there because I've already written what the puzzles are. It's just up to you to discover them. And maybe no one will, that's fine. They'll be in my papers at the Whitworth Collection in San Marcos. And so when I'm dead, you can take a look and you can say, this guy was not BSing us. Um, anyway, so should I read Cliff a little yeah, piece? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But, but I accept your puzzle challenge. <laughs> and I, will, I mean, I will say, uh, I looked at it a few times to prepare for tonight. I did not notice the table of contents until the second time. And yet I had a sort of subconscious understanding uh, of that evolution, that progression that you're talking about. It's, it's, right. it's got a real effect on the reader, I think. Yeah. And so, it's, it's, it's not just about creating characters as a writer. It's also about how you create characters as a reader. It's also about um, how you yourself are many different characters, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, and and anyway, so I'm a big fan of Nietzsche, of course, um, the, the the philosophical sort of father of perspectivism. So this this little piece I'm going to read is, in fact, I'm, I'm dedicating dedicating it to David uh, Levinson. But he told me he liked this story earlier today. So I said, I'm going to read this story that I've never read before ever. So this is the first time. And, and just to give you a little background, it's the second story in the collection. It's, it's called New, New Englander. And this David Calderon is a, a character that you encounter in the first story. And he's from El Paso. But in this story, New Englander, you see him in New England. He, he, he grew up in El Paso. He uh, became a professor at Rutgers. But what you see in New England is that he's, he's 55 and he's, he's, he reminisces a little bit about this huge leap he made from starting very poor in El Paso to uh, where he ended up in New England. And, he's, and he has now a house um, that he shares with his wife uh, Jean Catherine, whom he met at Harvard. So a lot of this is somewhat autobiographical, but it's actually more than that because I'm all, I'm really interested in just using myself as a as a as a tool to explore ideas on the page and characters on the page. And so so he he lives in Kent, Connecticut. Uh, David Calderon, this Chicano from El Paso, and and if you've ever been to Kent, it is a quintessential New England town. In fact, it's been named as one of the most beautiful places for fall foliage in, in New England, better than Vermont, better than New Hampshire. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a town of 3,000 people, so mostly rural, mostly forest. And David uh, has, has made it, has made this huge leap from where he began to where he is now. And he's out uh, chopping wood. You know, not, not what a, a border kid would be doing from El Paso. He's chopping wood in the middle of the, of, the, of the New England forest and his house is nine acres. And, uh, and, and you know, he has a, a wife whom he loves dearly and he's by himself just doing his work. And, and he's become an academic where he started really as, a, as an obrero, as a laborer. Um, and, and so, some of the things to think about is who is the real New Englander? That's a question to think about in this story. And what does it mean to be a New Englander? Because as David is working outside and working chopping wood, uh, he sees somebody coming from his very long driveway, which is about uh, a fifth of a mile long. And his, his house is in the middle of the forest. And this, this person that walks up to him and, as he, and he puts away his tools, he sees him coming down this, this dirt road that is his driveway. 
uh, is a guy that he says looks like Cormac McCarthy. Um, sort of Scottish, Irish sort of accent. David, David Calderon doesn't really know. And he looks sort of like a, what you would say in, in Kent is a townie, somebody who kind of grew up in Kent, but not, let's say, from the well-to-do, because there's certainly a, a certain New York crowd that's, that's there as well. And um, the first thing he does, this, this person coming to up David's driveway, is he um, holds a gun up to him and he's about to rob him. And so I'm gonna read this section um, that is sort of after this has happened and David doesn't know what's going on. And David also has gotten soft by being basically a professor <laughs> at Rutgers. Um, so, so this is just a five minute piece. What, what did this man want from him? They marched alongside the creek over and around dead logs, meandering channels of water, deeper into a primordial valley of nature's matter. And by the way, I'm on page 32 in the middle, if anyone wants to follow. Sun bright yellow and cinnamon colored leaves covered the uneven muddy floor. Oaks and maples and birches hovered overhead in the spectacle of a New England fall, a fluttery animate ceiling. Would this man kill him? David had never seen him before, but that didn't matter one way or another now. This man, David imagined, breathing hard, was being chased by the police. He was running away. Was David a hostage to keep the police at bay? Should he refuse to go on? Why did this man need him? If he stopped, if David refused to take another step, he would die, but if they lost themselves deeper in the valley toward Lake Warramug, away from his house, what would stop this lunatic from killing David anyway? What would stop him from eliminating the only witness to his escape? Hey, keep moving. I'm not going anywhere. You don't need me. Please leave me alone. You're free. Just leave me alone. Did I tell you to stop? You fucking disobeying me, asshole spick, the man shouted at David's face, shoving the gun barrel into his chest again. Think I can't guess what the fuck you are, Dominican, Puerto Rican piece of shit? David imagined he was quick enough to snatch the gun from the man's hand, quick enough to grab the hand with the gun in it and give himself a chance, but the moment came and went, and the man stepped back, grinning, raised the gun and pointed it at David's head. Start moving or I'm putting a bullet in your skull. No, please leave me alone. You're free. Please just go. I haven't done anything to you. I don't know who you are. You can go in any direction from here. I won't be able to tell anybody where you went. There's 500 acres of forest all around us. A sudden revelation flashed through David's mind. If this man shoots me, they will hear him. Suddenly something hard, the barrel or the handle of the gun, David did not quite see what, smashed into his face. A piercing, blinding pain erupted in his head. Blood gushed into his ear across one eye, and he raised his hand instinctively to protect himself. Another blow came from the other side with a savage kick to his stomach. David collapsed next to the creek. He clenched his fist and a horrible wild anger seized him even as another punch landed against his neck and more blows rained on his head. Stunned and half blinded, David instinctually grabbed the hand. He didn't have the gun. And he wrestled with the man who still smashed the gun barrel repeatedly onto David's head and shoulders. David was on his knees and the man struggled to break free of David's grip. At once David grabbed the thigh and like a savage bull shoved his head and shoulders into the man's stomach. David and the man crashed on top of a pile of leaves hiding in an upended tree stump. The man unleashed the guttural scream. 
David stumbled on top of him and lunged for the hand with the gun. Blood dripped from his face. For a second, he glimpsed the blue flames of the man's eyes blinking as splashes of David's blood fell on the man's cheeks. David gripped the gun with all his power, pushing the barrel away from him. He would die if he let go of the gun. The man kneed David's back from behind, shoving his face with one hand. David struggled to stay on top of him and gripped the hand with the gun so tightly his knuckles whitened. He fended off the man's punches and grabbed the man's neck with his free hand. The gun exploded. The billet missed both of them. They rolled on the ground, trying to grab control of the gun. I'll stop right there. <laughs> and, and, and hope you guys read the rest to find out what happened. Um, and to think about, you know, what, um, what the title means, you know, New Englander. Because I think that's really the, the crux of the story. Anyway, what did you think about that, Cliff? Well, I think this is a perfect example of, a, of several things, including your, your great craft. And, and they, the other David and I were, you know, talking about what a devastating story this is. Um, I, I would, this is the kind of story I, I would take into a workshop and, and look at how there's one of these turnaround, a peripatea, uh, a, a traumatic change that is totally surprising and kind of totally prepared for too. It's, it's very craftily foreshadowed that there's something coming up the driveway too. Um, and, and that's what I was thinking about reading this whole book is how, um, I think you've made this analogy too about music. This is like a concept album to me where the songs uh, all hold up on their own, you know, as they're all hits, but uh, together they become something else too. They turn into something else. And um, in this case, alongside the first story, which is Rosary on the Border, right. I think, uh, like you said, yeah, these are these are uh, kind of gems of stories, and but the the facets get turned uh, as we progress through, and it's it is it is a different kind of David. The the David in the first story talks a lot about sort of the toxicity of of the same kind of thing he has to draw on uh, exactly when he when he encounters you know. This, this threat. Uh, the, so I think this is a beautiful quote. It's actually from the last, from the, the, from the first story, if I may. And it, it should be like an epigram or something. He's, he's looking, in the first story, he's, he's at the funeral of his father in Isleta. Um, and he's standing by, by the casket, as, as I recall. I do not fear that only this fragile armor of meat surrounds this self. Uh, I think Shakespeare was wrong, at least for some of us. I think for some, the undiscovered country is not death, but life. Well, that's challenged immediately in New England. You know, it's, that's, that's a, a wonderful sentiment about not worrying about your fragile armor until it, it gets threatened. And uh, I mean, that kind of really effective uh, interplay it, it, I see going on in the collection all the time. Yeah, I mean, it, it's for, for me, it's, you know, the challenge is always, you know, when I'm writing a, a book, um, I, I wanted it to be so different from the first short story collection I did, which is basically, I, I wrote stories, they got published, and then I kind of threw them together. And that, that, that was the last tortilla, you know, and it did very well and, you know, won some prizes and all of that. But, but in this collection, you're absolutely right. I, 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 I love music and I, you know, uh, I love concept albums like The Wall, Pink Floyd's The Wall or, or whatever it is that you like. And, and so for me, it was a, a symphony in 13 pieces. And it was always dealing with perspectivism since I've been studying that and reading about it uh, philosophically for the last 30 years. But I, I kept thinking, well, how can I use the forms I know, whether it's a novel or whether it's something else, um, to, to, to play with perspectivism in a literary format that is 
that, that, not, that hasn't necessarily been done before, at least hasn't been done in this way. And so, so that's why this collection, I started piecing the stories together and then I had this vision. I said, this is how I, how, how I can do it. I can do it within the stories. I can do it within the characters. I can even challenge the perspective of the reader so that as they read these, and it's all about immigrants and it's all about, you know, um, these questions that immigrants face on trying to deal with identity, but it's also about philosophical identity and the, the identity of the self. That has nothing, you know, that, that's a, a, an important question for, for, for anybody who's not an immigrant as it is for somebody who is an immigrant. And so, 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 so for me, that was the challenge and, and being able to tell stories that were entertaining, that would bring the reader in, because I'm always trying to seduce the reader <laughs> with entertainment but then once I get you I'm going to teach you something I hope in a surprising way that will say well wait a minute what how did what is that what is that what did he just do here mm -hmm. um, you know talking about identity or death or talking about who's the real New Englander what does it mean to be um, a pilgrim who is more identified with the pilgrims for example yeah. Uh, the people who are here expecting privilege and expecting to take what you have gained or the person who started in poverty and worked their ass off, a typical immigrant story, and failed and succeeded and failed and succeeded and then achieved something. And that's seen as, well, illegitimate. Why? Because you're brown or because you're you're you speak with an accent or you have a funny last name that's not, um, you know, uh, not a, a quintessential New England name. And so, so these are all questions that, of course, I had, you know, when I was playing with the story. And, and, and you know, and even in the, you just look at the two stories, Rosie on the Border, David is going back to bury his father. It's about death. And then the next one I wanted to be, this is about why you fight not to die. Mm -hmm. How you recall an inner self long lost, you know, the self of Sergio, um, you know, being an arsonist in his canal in, in, uh, in, in Isleta and, uh, you know, and, and, and fighting and usually actually getting beat up. I was not, <laughs> I was not a tough guy, I was a bookworm of the chubby bookworm who, but I was surrounded by these people. Um, and so, so all of these questions on the character David Calderon in the second story come up. So the very thing, and you're, you're very right, Flip, the very thing that enervates him, that, that he questions, I had to overcome this. In the second story, that's the very thing that saves him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if that makes sense. I, I think so. I consider you, well, some people I, I have seen, uh, you know, even try to label you as a, as a kind of border writer, which I always felt is, is like saying Faulkner is a Southern writer. It's, it's not wrong, but it's not nearly enough for everything that's going on, right? It's, it's true, right. but not adequate. And uh, yeah, I cannot remember anything, another collection like this that I've seen, um, for one. Um, and, 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 and it's true, by the way, it's frustrating because I do spend a lot of time, in fact, more time on the philosophy of, the, of when, I, when I write a story or when I write a novel, and then, and then just try to actualize it on the page with characters and, and issues and questions. And so, and, and I, think, I think the problem is most people are not really careful readers. We don't live in a society in which careful reading really is the core. Like I, I always felt I should have been born in 19th century Russia, you know, with these long 500, 600 no page novels where people really sat for hours fighting and arguing about nihilism and death and, you know, what's the, what's the politics of this and of writing and it mattered to people, you know, and not the sort of the bullshit flimsy iPhone Twitter world that we sort of live in, you know, which is sort of a, a pale, you know, a pale reflection of what it used to be. Um, 
you know, give me, give me something much deeper and much more involved. Uh, and it doesn't sell, by the way. That's part of the part of the issue. You know, who who's read, you know, you know, uh, Dostoevsky or Tolstoy or, or you know, some of the great uh, Russian writers. Uh, you know, and they are read here and there in school, but uh, for pleasure. I think it's rare. Gogol, exactly. That's by the way. I'm in the middle of rereading, um, you know, his stories, um, which I, I love. Mm -hmm. Well, you are work with, working with publishers who give you free reign as, as far as the way you want it to be, too. This this is Cinco Puntos, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and and you know, and this is by the way has to do with creativity and also um, setting your life to do that, because very early on, I said I'm going to write what I want to write, and it doesn't matter if it's commercial. It doesn't matter if it's, and if it is great, but that's not, I'm not gonna, and, and, and I tell this to young writers that, you know, I teach a workshop at Yale every year. And I said, you have to set up your life so that you can do that. So you do not compromise your craft because of, um, you know, you need to pay a mortgage payment or you need to. And, and, and so one of the things I did, and I started this actually senior year at, at Harvard, is I became, uh, you know, I started investing, I started saving money, and I started, and, and, and even when I had very little money, um, and I taught myself that so that I would be free of any of the vagaries of the market, ironically, because I understood how to make money in the market. Um, and as my wife would sit, tell me as a philosophy student, I had uh, my bed at Yale. Uh, I had cinder blocks that I had found on the street of New Haven. I had a piece of plywood and a piece of foam that I found also. And those were my, that was my bed, by the way, in New Haven. And, <laughs> and, I, and I was learning how to invest the scholarships that I would get and the prizes that I would win so that it would free myself to do the art I wanted to do without worrying about um, whether it made money or not. And as my wife said, you lived, I lived like a monk, but I had the biggest uh, bank account anyone, anyone you know, in, in my graduate program. Um, and I'm still like that. I mean, I'm, I'm a penny pinching <laughs> you know, human being, but it, it has to do with, I will not be compromised um, and I follow uh, what Warren Buffett taught, teaches, which is the most important position to be in in any negotiation is the ability to walk away. Yeah. To walk away and, 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 and not at the bluff, not at, but in reality. And so whenever I negotiate with a publisher, this is how I want to publish it. This is why I'm doing it. And I'll explain to them all of what I'm doing. And if you want it, fine, but you're not gonna change it. You're not gonna threaten me, I'll walk. And I do, and I have, by the way. Mm -hmm. And, and it, people will tell you, I'm actually a very hard negotiator. I, yeah. I won't tell you my percentages, but my other writers have told me, you know, you need to teach this, Sergio, because you're actually, you know, great at it. Um, and, and why? Because I will walk unless I get what I want. I will, I will sign up for that, for that workshop, Sergio, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's that's very inspiring, and I'm I'm thinking pretty rare for writers, writers and most artists. Well, I'm I'm good at math, so that was one of the other afflictions I had on the border. I love to write, but I'm also really good at math. Well, uh, there's I mean there's so much to talk about here, I, but speaking of the border, and I I do consider I've always considered you. I don't know if you do, but uh, someone who is very concerned with place, especially like the spirit of place. The influence, the, the spirit of, of place, place, uh, right? Leta. And I don't know if this is part of the puzzle, but I did notice that the setting of the first story and the last story is is Isleta. The others are elsewhere, though. But the pl the place never leaves the consciousness of anyone. I think there's a that Ricky Quintana uh, character says 
he's let the invades my consciousness or something some words to that effect very very interesting character too yeah and ricky quintana he's in a, a story face to face yes uh which is in the middle of the collection and that's grouped with three different stories one yamaka and another one called fragments of a dream and by the way in in this collection of three stories you'll see i'm also playing with perspective in how the narrator tells the story um you know in in yamaka which is by the way not yamaka that you wear you know on your head but uh yamaka the original name of jamaica plains in new york that was a native american name um that got sort of bastardized to jamaica by sort of english and the dutch um that's for example a story told both in spanish and english yeah and no translation so you have to actually be able to you know to 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 understand spanish and english to get the full effect of that story mm -hmm. and then in the other stories and uh, fragments of a dream for example the perspectivism is also from a, a, a um you know a voice that is very different from the others as well so so it, within within the craft aspect of these stories i'm also playing with how you tell a story and how why you would tell this story in this voice versus how you why you would tell it in that other voice even as the content is shifting in perspective as well but but ricky quintana in face to face as you know is a merrill lynch biotech analyst <laughs> you know my alter ego um as my my wife said because because you know my wife um works in the finance industry and she knows my returns and i'll brag about them by the way because um because this is a sort of a side people don't know but you know i have a portfolio that i run and that i created for myself and i've beaten the s p 500 for one year for five years for 10 years for 15 years my wife says As I, should, I, should, I, I should have been a, a hedge fund manager <laughs> um, but Ricky Quintana is sort of my alter ego, so to speak. He works for Merrill Lynch, and and he is a biotech analyst. And he he's from Isleta. He's from the border, mm -hmm. and he's living the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And he um, keeps hearing this. Can you say asshole on Zoom and in the big read, or can you say all sorts of bad words? So he, he, fuck already so okay oh good yeah good. please do so this is like a podcast excellent um so so he keeps hearing this guy armstrong ferry which is an amalgam of many different um people on the you know on the on the tv there's the far right wing nut mm -hmm. um sort of a combination of uh everyone from Lou, Lou Dobbs to Laura Ingram to, uh, you know, name, you know, Tucker Carlson. I, I and, saw Tucker. Right. I mean, it's, and frankly, frankly, when this story was written, Tucker Carlson was not even on the air. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, yes. you created him. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so, so, we, so, so anyway, so, so Ricky, who's very successful, he's wears Ferragamo, you know, uh, ties and, and, and Ferragamo ties and, and, you know, expensive suits. He's hearing this guy talk about immigrants and he knows how he started. And it just, it, it, it drives him crazy. And, and then at the same time, he goes to, he, he himself, because he's been successful, he goes to Fairway. I don't know if anyone lives on the Upper West Side, but he goes to Fairway, right? Uh, which is a very sort of inexp uh, expensive sort of Zabar's like, market and he has over time befriended an illegal immigrant julio gonzalez who works stacking the shelves at fairway and um and so so in a way he's ricky is thinking i was like julio yet i am not like him anymore and and why what you know why does this country allow this idiot armstrong ferry to vilify immigrants to attack them and and they just work their ass off and they're not you know they're not being appreciated and understood in a way um and and also ricky is also feeling a little guilty you know he's he's gone beyond julio in a way um yeah i know fairway did get bought unfortunately it's not the same as it was um 
and so anyway, so, so this story is about what Ricky decides to do, something using his biotech, um, biotech knowledge to, to get back, I, I'll just say that, at Armstrong Ferry, mm -hmm. to respond to Armstrong Ferry. But the other interesting thing that's happening in the story face to face is that the, the Julio is the one who's going to be repeated. So the way you see Julio yes. in face to face changes in the next story, Yamaka, because Yamaka is told from the perspective of Jimena Garza, Julio's Guatemalan wife in, in Jamaica. And you're gonna get a very different version of who Julio is. Mm -hmm. And then in the last story, of course, uh, in that group, Fragments of a Dream, Julio becomes a principal character. Um, and so who you thought Julio was in the beginning may not be who you think he ends up being toward the end of this of this little group of, of collection. Does that make sense, Cliff? Yeah, I think I'm glad we're talking about that. I, I, I believe without uh, spoiling anything, someone finds what they call a bloody triptych at, at the end. And I thought that was a kind of a good description of, of that trilogy of stories. Right. Absolutely right. The uh, it's the multi -pers perspectivism to the, to the point where you know Julio is is a completely different figure at the end, and yet I'm also and and pretty evil figure. Yet I also feel sorry for him. Like these, the the face to face story takes the personal immigrant experience and and shows how it's playing out across the nation. You know how it's taking us down some very bad road. So so that you almost have to see Julio as the actor, but he's also a victim of this, of this uh, an attack. Yeah, and, and in my mind, it is the same Julio you see in face to face. It just, this is Julio at work, but at home, he, you know, he may not be the most noble character that you would imagine. Um, and, and so, so, and I think that's, that's who we are. You know, we are all of these characters. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, um, you know, I'm the guy who's writing at home. I'm also this chubby guy who, who loved to read, you know, back in Isleta. I'm mm -hmm. also, I, I'm sure a lot of people here would say sort of an SOB, you know, and I, <laughs> I, can, be, I can be pretty tough when people push me. Uh, and, and I am all of that. Um, and I've also, you know, there's some secret cells that no one will know until way after, you know, I'm gone. Uh, and people say, oh, wow, that was said here too. I, I was thinking that that action of, of the different facets works inside the stories as well, because I like Ricky a lot. Wow. I'm not sure I approve of, of what he does. I'm not, <laughs> probably people need to read that story to see. Uh, it's like, I get it, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, temp the temptation to do that is very strong, but um, he's, he's really not drawing on his Isleta sort of manhood for, for the approach he takes. Oh, so no. That problem. No. He, I mean, you, you know, and, and, it, and it, that does have a, a question as to, um, you know, do some people deserve what, what's coming to them or not? And I'm always fascinated by that question even when it's the ultimate yeah. form of vengeance. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, I've, I've explored sort of that question in, in like the novel, The Nature of Truth, for example. Um, I'm a big which, fan. I'm a big right. fan. So, so, you know, that, that question of, um, is it just about, you know, if you can get away with it, yeah. why isn't that truthful? Why isn't that right? And yeah. if you have a real reason to, to follow a very horrible act, uh, why, why, you know, why shouldn't you? And, and as I said, this is my philosophical self. I, I basically explore these questions in my head, sometimes for months, sometimes for years, before I ever write a single word down of the story or the novel that, that, that eventually comes out from these questions. And so that, that's kind of how I approach my craft in many ways. 
I'm thinking a, a lot and writing a lot of notes and characters and dis get discarded, sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of pages before I ever start writing anything down. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. The, there is so much to get into and I, I guess we're getting close to where we, we will take some questions, but I've got to hear about Library Island. I just have to, <laughs> you know, I, I think, uh, like you say, the stories kind of progress and right. so we end up in a very dystopian, uh, fantastic futuristic realm. Um, and I don't know if I should say that. I've got a theory about where that's, that came from, actually. Okay. It came, and it's because of what you told us at dinner when you were here in 2018. I believe it was the Penn Faulkner. Yeah. Story. Uh, oh, that's absolutely you, true. I got okay. Well, hey, well, I got one puzzle. Uh, but <laughs> well, in fact, I, I sent it to them to the uh, director of the Penn Faulkner Foundation. I said I wrote this um, to commemorate my experience there. So the the I just I'll tell people the story a little bit, and then I'll yeah. I'll tell them about the Penn Faulkner that inspired that story. Um, so in Library Island, this Arturo Martinez, and this is taking place in a dystopian United States or what used to be the United States. And um, because, because, you know, because people have become more violent and more stupid and, and really in many ways, non-readers, that's really the undercurrent of the story. Um, we've started losing community hold on each other. And so, our, uh, so, so what happens is uh, Arturo, who lives in what used to be New York City, hears about this place called Library Island, a sanctuary somewhere in the West. And if you can get to this place, you'll save yourself from the violence happening in society. And so he's not sure if it exists or not. He's, he, he's Edward, one of his friends, um, had told him about it. There's some secret newsletters, you know, that they're exchanging and, and trying to find out if this library island truly exists. And so eventually Arturo sets out because the violence has become so untenable in, in the United States to see if it exists, to see if he can find the sanctuary. So the library island is about this place that to gain entrance to it, you have to read. You, in fact, in, in many ways, you're tortured by reading and reading until you drop, and then you've got to do it the next day and the next day. And, and you're, you're sent these, these boxes of 25 books. You have to read them in 10 days. And then you have to tell an interlocutor what you read. And if you miss any of these stories, if you do not read it correctly, you're, you're expunged, which means killing is the easiest thing that can happen. You actually don't, you don't exist anymore. You're eliminated. You're probably killed and just disappeared. But that's a test to get into Library Island. If you have to pass this grueling test over many weeks of reading to, to survive. And, um, and so that's what happens to Arturo. And I, I won't tell you the, 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 the rest of it and, and what happens to him um, if he makes it and what Library Island is like inside. But it's really a commentary, of course, on, on our society and what's happening when we can't have an in-depth discussion anymore, when all our, all our discussions and opinions are about 20 characters or two minutes because of the media and how it has shaped and, and really malformed our, our brains so that we've become sort of stupefied. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and so, so that's sort of really the question. And it came from the Penn Faulkner experience. So I, I was asked, the idea, I was asked to be a judge uh, for the Penn Faulkner Award a few years ago. And they choose three national judges and I was one of them. And um, the only Chicano, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, in, in, yeah, for a while, actually. I think there's been some since, since me. And that year we had 
a record number of entries, 493 books submitted to the Penn Faulkner. More books submit, are typically submitted to the Penn Faulkner than the Pulitzer Prize. And you're talking about Joyce Carol Oates, Stephen King, you name, you know, Jonathan Friends, and you name your, your famous writer, they're in it. And mm -hmm. why? Because uh, the Penn Faulkner is a, is a literary, is probably the quintessential literary prize, even bigger than the Pulitzer, because the Pulitzer is also affected by commercialism in a way that the Penn Faulkner is not, in my mind, in my opinion. But more entries typically go into the Penn Faulkner than, than they do in the, the Pulitzer. So we had about nine, 10 months to read it, 493 books. That's about two books a day. Um, yeah, and, and so, and of course, it's sort of a, it's crazy to do this because you're getting these boxes of 25 books and they're all hard covers, all brand new books. They're all famous writers. And you have to then discuss with the, your two other writers who are also really good readers and, 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 um, and writers, these books as they come in. So you are reading 18 to 20 hours um, a day and you're paid for this. You're, you're paid to put away your teaching duties. You're paid to, to read for all of this time. My wife got me a special chair that I would sit in and read. And, and also the, as, a, as, a, as somebody who's, you know, I said, you're only asked to do once in your life to be a Penn Faulkner judge. You know, they, really they, they don't ask uh, you to do it twice in your life because it really disrupts your entire year. And at a certain point, my, uh, after reading for weeks and months like this, my, my right leg got numb because, and I, I, I told the Penn Faulkner people, I said this is I called it my Penn Faulkner blood clot, um, and 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 it truly got numb, and eventually my the feeling came back in my leg uh, after I, I finished reading, um, and and I also wanted to do it right. By the way, I wanted to actually read the books that I you know that and I would start reading, and and what, one of the things that happened by the way when you read so much because I, I read hundreds of books, I didn't read every all 493, because one of the things that happens is when you read so much, you become a merciless critic. Within the first paragraph, I could tell this book has mistakes already. This book has character issues or has you know, prose issues or has perspective issues because you really start honing in on what's gonna be a great book. So any of the books that end up in the last 10 or 15, after haggling and talking with the other writers, they're all great books mm -hmm. in every which way, from characterization to the, the, the rhythm of, the, of each sentence, to um, the topic, to um, the dialogue, to the experimentation of craft. So all of this has to, you know, has to be great. And then, and then you have to choose one. So there's even more you know, uh, discussing and arguing within three, three writers. But that, that experience really transformed me in a very fundamental way. And so, for, so the first thing I tell my, my workshop students, because I give them a lot of work, I'm known as basically a hard ass, but I also love my students. If they do the work, if they survive my workshop, they will become excellent writers because I will give them work and, that they have to turn in within the day. I give them, I have two or three exercises every day. They have to do it that night. They have to give it back to me. And I give them reading, reading until they're almost crying. And some of them do cry. And when they, but with, if they get through the workshop, they will become a different writer than when they came in. And it's all about work. It's all about taking apart your work. And so this is what the, ten, the Penn Faulkner experience taught me. Um, and, and so I wanted to write, I said, well, why don't we, why don't I, after I, I'm done and after my, my, the feeling in my right leg came back, uh, I said, I want to write a story about when reading is torture. And so that became the genesis of Library Island. Well, you, you may have forgotten <laughs> that you told us that story when you approached me to uh, judge the Troncoso Prize, because that story scared the hell out of me, you know? <laughs> um, uh, and and Fletcher, I see, is asking what book it was that year. What was what was the book? For the, the, the the one I the one we chose. Yeah, Delicious yes. Foods by James Hanahan. 
Okay. Delicious oh, thank Foods you. by James Hanahan. Yeah, it's a great book that all the judges love, not just for the story, but also for the the craft of, you know, an inanimate object, the drug, um, becomes a, a character in the book, among many other things that is great about that book. It's important socially, it's great characters and storytelling, it's exciting. And it's also does something from a craft point of view that no other book had done. And so all of these things had to come together. Um, you know, so he's a he's an excellent writer. So and and the you know there were other five, um, you know, books that uh, and any of those could have won. Uh, in fact, Luis Urea, the Water Museum, uh, that short story collection was one of the five that ended up as well in that uh, in that final five. I I'd like to throw in quickly that uh, Sergio is a is a force in American letters, but he is also a a big promoter you know of all kinds of things there is the Sergio Troncoso branch of the El Paso library which is a fantastic I think any every writer that's is their kind of dreams to have something like that and you and there are reading awards for youth there at, that you sponsor right which I fund yeah and and that that was probably one of the biggest honors I've gotten that the El Paso public library decided to name a branch library, the branch library from Isleta, which is one of the biggest um, in, the, in the El Paso library system. They named it after me and, and I was thrilled, but I also wanted to encourage the next generation, the kids there, the high school kids and the middle school kids to read. And so I pay them to read. I, you know, I, I fund these prizes, six prizes every year for kids in high school and kids in, in uh, middle school. And whoever reads the most books from um, September to December every year uh, will, uh, the first prize I think is 150 bucks of books. The next prize is $125 and the uh, third prize is $100. And I give six of these prizes every year and I fly down there and I give them copies of my own books. And then I talk to the parents as well about, you know, because they invariably ask me, how did a kid like you who grew up here end up at Harvard and Yale? And I, you know, so it becomes sort of an education session and we talk and I talk to the parents in Spanish and, and so, uh, and in English, of course. And so, uh, you know, I believe in helping the next generation. I believe in helping the young kids out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think reading changed my life. Reading made me who I am now. And so uh, that's sort of a, a message I wanna keep impressing on the, on the younger generation. Well, well, Sergio came to our college and was so generous and hung out with students all day long. And, and I remember you were talking to ESOL students and developmental students, people who are really struggling with writing and you t talk to them like they're writers, you know? And you, I remember you told them, write things that upset people. If you're if you're not upsetting people, you're probably not really writing, you know, which which uh, really struck home with me. And you you hung out with our um, literary arts council, but you did with the Texas Institute of Letters is the Troncoso Prize, which is for first publications, first fiction publications. So, you know, it's uh, it's just great work. It's just great work that you're doing. And, uh, in addition to being the president of, of the TIL these days. Uh, Which is a lot of work. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's like having another full-time job. Well, you know, there's, uh, I think of Sergio as, as a pretty rare animal, the public, the public intellectual, which <laughs> we used to have, <laughs> right? And, and probably they still have in the... Who, who just trying to keep from fainting every day from all the stuff I have to do. Yeah, probably. Your, just your inbox from email from TIL is, is probably incredible. Um, Could I butt in and uh, maybe we can have some questions from the audience? Are there questions from the audience? One from I know you. I had a question. I'm going to kick, I'm going to ask my question. Ready? So there's that show on Netflix called War. Blah. I don't know if anyone's watched it. It's like these short little 
es their what are they their uh, pictorial essays. They're kind of lame, but one of them was about why we like watching antiheroes, basically, and why Scorsese is the master of antiheroes and how he once famously said, like, I don't give a shit if you like my characters or not, fuck off, that kind of thing. So when I was reading your book, I was like, I don't, there's some of these characters are, I don't really like some of them. In fact, I kind of hate some of them for what they do. So I'm curious, I wonder if, I know that I have gotten in the past from my lovely editors at commercial houses who have said, can't you make your characters more likable? And I inevitably will say, sure. And I try doing it and it doesn't make them more likable. So I'm curious to hear from you if your editors have ever said, will you make your characters more likable? And if you tell them to fuck off. Well, I I probably wouldn't be as rude as you would be, David, in a nicer way. I've been a- No, I'm pretty in rude. In sort of the TIL way of, um, <laughs> I would tell them, no, thank you. Um, but I mean, interestingly enough, all right, interestingly enough, um, there is, and, and this is like some news um, that I recently got, um, there is um, movie interest. I have now uh, a, an agent from APA, one of the biggest um, movie um, groups in, in Beverly Hills. Um, to represent Matt Damon, not only in a peculiar kind of immigrant son, but in Nobody's Pilgrims, which is my new novel coming up. So my literary agent introduced me. They said, people have read these books and, and uh, Nobody's Pilgrims is out. They're just, it's now being distributed as an electronic ARC, uh, advanced reading copy. And so uh, they're interested in representing me. So people love these characters that I think, I mean, for me, it's about being authentic and not whether you love them or hate them, but are they true characters that describe not just the life affirming and positive things we do, but also how sometimes we come through the muck, how come, sometimes we rise from the muck to become something that's wonderful. Uh, but like, for example, one, one character that I love um, is Galilea Rivero you know, from this new now. Um, she's sort of a, you know, uh, an independent woman who grew up on the border, who ends up in New York City and is a version of me as well, who, who says, I'm gonna be against all the macho shitheads that I grew up on the border. I'm going to be my own person and I'm not gonna be ashamed of it. I'm going to, you know, go out with the men I want, how I want, and I am going to be setting the terms of the debate. Um, and she pulled a little bit by the border, but not too much. Galilea is an independent woman. So, so there are people, but, you know, it, some people might be rubbed the wrong way by that sort of fierce independence of a, of a, of a woman who just calls it the way she sees it. And it's not going to be apologetic at all. And she is a version of me as well. Um, so so, so I, I don't really spend a lot of time. And I think publishers know me well enough <laughs> to not ask me to. I mean, I, I, I will listen to, to story, story issues. And I do ruminate a lot about um, trying to get the reader, seduce the reader into a story. And Nobody's Pilgrims is like this. This new novel coming out in May. It's a visual, exciting story, but it's also about immigration and it's also about love and three teenagers escaping the border uh, and being pursued by very evil people and, and how the young are resilient even when they're poor. And even when two of them, one is undocumented, another one is a Mexican-American and another one is the poor white teenager, a woman, they meet in Missouri. Uh, in a little small town in Missouri. And people say, well, how do you know? And, and in fact, the editor who is from Missouri, one of my editors at this house um, that, that is publishing it in New York um, that, that bought Cinco Punto said, how do you know Missouri so well? Because I grew up in Missouri. I said, well, one of the reasons is I had people like Molly 
as my students, because I taught in Independence, Missouri for eight years. I don't know if people know that. And so I knew, I know Missouri teenagers. I had them in my class and I taught them uh, repeatedly. And, and the uh, interesting thing was, I felt a lot of connection, especially amongst poor white kids from rural Missouri. I felt a, a connection with them and, under, and, and understood them in a way because they also are coming from nothing. They don't look like me, but they're coming from nothing and they're fighting for their place and they don't know where to go. And, and so, so um, that's how I was able to write that Molly character that becomes so important in this new novel coming out, Nobody's Pilgrim. But, you know, I mean, if it becomes a, a movie, that would be terrific. I don't expect it will be. I mean, I'm, I'll be happy uh, with the option money because I know most books don't get, made, don't get made. But, you know, people are interested. So maybe eventually, David, just to answer your question, you know, the, the, what's accepted by the public comes to you rather than you going to it. I don't know. I mean, frankly, I'm always thrilled when somebody reads my work, um, but I, I'm going to stick to my guns and try to tell a good story, an exciting story, but an, a story that unmoors you, that challenges you, that makes you think a little bit, maybe a lot, uh, that could be controversial um, because I'm not into um, you know, stereotypical literature or, or, or easy, literature that uh, too often I think printed I mean because I read a lot and I know what's crap out there and some of the crap is being printed by great New York publishers sorry that's that's you know that might not be news to people but it is it, it sometimes sells hundreds of thousands of copies but it's still crap and it, it'll be gone in a year in two years you know it'll sell a lot it'll make a lot of money but it's from a literary point of view yeah, I'm going to preach <laughs> MA because, it, you know, if I do the work, if I'm reading hundreds of books a year, I could damn right, I, tell, I, I will tell you what, why this particular book is crap, you know, and I'll dissect it in pieces. Um, and so I'm pretty confident about what I'm doing. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, um, that you don't want to write something that's popular, but I'm not going to sacrifice what I do. Yeah, just my brain is not made that way. You know, I was going to be a philosophy professor. You talk about a more dismal professional career than, than being a literary writer. Well, think about a philosophy professor. So, you know, you know uh, very educated and very unemployed. So I never really cared about money, although I'm, you know, I'm more or less good at making it. Um, I don't know. I'm full of contradictions. What can I tell you? Yeah, like your yeah. characters. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting Other questions? That, that I'm thinking that uh, peculiar kind of immigrant son, there's no way that could be a movie, but I think I'm wrong. That, well, that is well, kind of filming, the, actually. So somebody proposed a series uh -huh. on immigration, like for Netflix, actually, yeah. uh, on immigration in which you would go through these characters. So, I mean, I don't know if it'll come to pass, but. As, as long as you negotiated. Right. The, <laughs> yeah, something good. Um, other questions from the. Uh... Um, I was just gonna, you know, I have not been able to read all the stories in your collection. I'm really enjoying them, Sergio, and I'm gonna definitely read more after tonight. Um, but I was just um, enjoying like the starts of a lot of your stories. You really seem to like, just I, I, like there's very particular vivid circumstances that seem to like be immediate, like the one about the guy taking the Cialis from the like. So I, I just like a nerdy writing <laughs> question, you know, um, do you have a hard time with story openings or is there any way like, do you write a million pages and then find the opening line or just your thoughts on your experiences with that, that opening line? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you asked that question because because for me to get to that opening line or even the op opening paragraph, I spent reams, well, it's not reams anymore because I don't write it by hand. I'm just typing notes on the computer. I'm typing character notes. I'm thinking of story. 
and, and I will end up writing dozens and dozens of pages before I write that opening line. So, so it's never, oh, what's going to be my opening line to this story? I already have like 30, 50 pages on, you know, who Galilea Rivero might be and what she might mm -hmm. she be thinking and where is she and what's her background and, and what are the possible things of the story. And so I, I just, since computer is, you know, I'm not killing any trees, I can, I have thousands of files like that, which are just notes. And, and I also write, I also have a, a, a physical uh, little um, notebook that I carry around with me and write stuff that occurs to me as I'm walking or running or, you know, getting sliced turkey from Zabar's or whatever I'm doing. Um, and so, so all of this feeds into the opening line. So when, when I start dreaming about a story, when um, start thinking about characters at night, because I dream a lot, mm -hmm. I know for me that's, that's, that's when I have to start writing the story. And so I wait for that, even if it takes a long time. And for me, then that opening line, you will say is, or opening scene is instinctual, but it mm -hmm. comes from all of this work that's preceded it on, on character, on story, on, on, on how they're gonna talk. Um, and so, so, you know, and, and I tend to work on several projects at the same time. And why? Because I think I know how my mind works. I have a long-term project. I'm always working either on a long book, a novel or something. And then I have a little, an essay somebody asked me to write or a short story, a few short stories that I'm working on. Some of them more or less complete. Some of them at the very beginning stage and just freeform notes. And so when I get stuck on something, I just leave it. I save the file and I go to something else and I work on something else. And for me, that, that's a good way to never really have writer's block, never really be stopped by what's gonna be my opening line or what's gonna be my opening scene, because I'm, I'm usually working on three or four or five projects at the same time. Um, and and you know, I know not everybody does that, but, but it's, it's taken me a long time to see, well, this is how my mind works. Um, and and so, so that's what I do. No, it's fascinating. You know, I'm a poet and I've always loved that about poems. You're like, damn, this one's really got me like stuck. And then if you go working on other poems, you kind of often come back to that poem and it helps, right? You, you not all of your investment is in that one piece and finishing it. Right. So I, I love how you describe this. And that's fascinating, your whole process. Um, right. And, then and, I, and, I, and I have to tell you one, one thing, Alexandra, I read a lot of poetry. I've never written a poem in my life, <laughs> but I read, in fact, I probably read more poetry than I do anything else because I love to study people's lines. Mm -hmm. I love to study how careful people are with creating images and metaphors. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I have several poets like on my iPhone. So whenever I'm stuck on the subway or somewhere, for example, I have Emily Dickinson's collected work on my iPhone, which I'm constantly reading and rereading. And it's really to study the rhythm, study the, the line, study careful word choices. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I'm not a poet, but I'd love to read poetry simply to improve my own prose. Oh, no, I love that. <laughs> no, thanks. That was a very interesting response. I really appreciate that. Sure. We have like seven precious minutes left. Does anyone have other questions for Sergio of any kind? There's a good um, one here from Mary Armstrong. Oh, sure. Hmm. So Mary has an interest. Mary, do you want to ask this yourself? You can um, unmute and ask this, your, this question yourself. I'm looking for Mary in my chat box. I don't see her yet. Um. How's that for a test? You got me? Yes. <laughs> yep. Okay. I love to hear an author interpreting their own audio book rather than a hired actor. And I'm wondering why Sergio didn't read the book himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, A Peculiar Kind of Immigrant Son. Yes. This particular you book, know, yes. That's a good question. Uh, other than... 
I, th I think I could have said, I'll read the book myself. And I mm -hmm. love reading uh, my work. And a lot of it, I, I have stuff on YouTube and, and uh, sort of podcasts. If you go to Sergio Troncoso podcast in Apple, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, places where I've read my stories and read novel chapters or whatever. I'll do it. And, and, and for, for no reason other than that I, that I was a little busy when that sort of deal came through for, the, for that audio book of the Pituitan of Immigrant Son. And the, the person that we chose, they, they actually auditioned several people for me. And they said, it's going to be your choice who you, know, who you want. And it's a guy from New Mexico who, uh, uh, Timothy, I think, Pavon, who, who could do the Spanish and the English back and forth who really had a great rhythm and it, it, you know I wouldn't for example in fact even with Galilea when she he read the Galilea story that I love because I love her character this new now it's probably not how I would have read it but it's his own interpretation and frankly that audiobook has done phenomenally well and I liked him and I also felt well uh you know Let's see what he can do. I mean, but for no other reason than that, Mary, um, that I was very busy and, uh, and I thought I had a good substitute. And I, you know, I decided let's, let's have him do it. Because I would have had to have dropped everything. And I was in the middle of actually working on, on this book, Nepantla Familias, and working on Nobody's Pilgrims, my novel that's coming out in May. And I did not want to drop anything so i said let let him do the audiobook and i um you know i'll just keep working on my other stuff and by the way when when i'm doing this you know when i got my agent um not just my literary agent but also later this agent in in the movie business that's now um selling some of my stories and my my novels they asked me if i was interested in script writing and i said no I said, I know what I don't know. <laughs> and what I don't know is script writing. And I also, I'm a literary writer. That's what I love to do. I want to work on either short stories or novels or essays. And I'll let someone else do it. I'm going to wash my hands of it. I'm not going to do a Larry McMurtry and try to learn script writing. And he was a great script writer, by the way. Uh, and I've known writers who have tried that. But uh, I just feel like I, I know my wheelhouse. I know what I'm good at. And so I'm going to stick to that. OK, if I can throw in one more thing before I get out of here. The Obrero, I had to quit reading it. I was trying to go to sleep. I'm like, I won't be able to sleep. Which, which one? Was, which story is that? One, I don't remember the title of it. Was it Real New Englander? Um, the, the, you were talking about the Obrero is coming up the driveway. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. The New Englander. Yeah, the, the piece I wrote, to, I read today. Couldn't. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. It terrified me. So there you go. Good. I'm yeah. glad it terrified you. I'm just well, saying, you know, that was what you were looking for. You got it. I well, mean, you I know, I mean, I mean, I want readers to wake up. I don't want to put <gasps> readers to sleep or I don't want to give them some regurgitated stuff that they've already probably seen on TV. But it would, be, it would have been nice to, be, to let me sleep that night. That would have been all right. <laughs> just saying. But, you know, I, but, you know, I, I won't tell you what the ending was if you didn't, uh, if you didn't I read it. He died. Didn't he die? I mean, I did. Skip I'm not going to say anything, but I'm just going to say it's going to be listen, fulfilling listen, to you. Steps. It's going like to be he's... fulfilling to you, Mary, if you read that no, story. No, <laughs> I doubt I'll ever go back to it. It's no. about it's about resiliency, fighting for what you want, and overcoming <sighs> even the border of your body. Well, when last I saw him, he was on the next to last step. Did anybody find him? I don't know. I don't know. That was one of the puzzles. You're laughing at me. That's not fair. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. I'm not. No, okay. I'm not. In fact, but I, I, you know, it's true. When you write a hard story like that, uh, some people want to quit at the end. But I think if you read it all, you'll see that, you know, 
it's gonna it couldn't be a very fulfilling story for you um, that will open your eyes i mean like for example i'm watching succession uh, i don't know if you any of you have been watching that uh series yeah. succession oh my god that's like a train wreck every single every single episode of these people that are horrible um you know this elite idiots um, who are all horrible to each other, but you keep watch, watching because it's also about human nature and how they're power hungry in a way. And so anyway, uh, you know, and it's, it's not funny. You know, it's not like a Larry David train wreck where like Curb Your Enthusiasm where it's actually funny to watch somebody so awful. Um, succession is just sort of awful, but we keep watching it or certainly I keep watching it. And, and see what happens with this family. Um, but I think, you know, frankly, New Englander is a deeper story than just the violence he overcomes. It's a much deeper story than that. It's about who is the real New Englander? Like, and if you, if you were looking at what the pilgrims endured and, and went through, you would probably see um, some difficult life um, that, you know, pr wouldn't play well on Amazon Prime, but it was there. All right. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> not sure where we are on time. Uh, well, we're just after 8.30, so I guess we're going to have to, this was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to have to wrap this up, Sergio, but... Um, you know, Cliff, thank you so much. Wonderful job. Just interesting questions and guiding this conversation. We, I could tell we could easily have this continue for another half an hour or more. But, um, you know, this was a really interesting way to have. This is our last big Texas read of 2021. Our next one, actually, oh, Sergio in January is with Marisol Cortez, who won um, their Sergio Trancoso Best Fiction Prize last year. So that's kind of a nice synchronous, like, synchronicity there. <laughs> yeah, she's a wonderful writer. Yeah, no, I, in, in fact, I just did the TIL award winners panel uh -huh. at the Texas Book Festival, and she was one of the three writers I invited to be on the panel I moderated. Uh, she's terrific. Okay. She, she'll be here at our college in February, too. Oh, cool. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the Big Texas Read. Our next event is January 19th with Marisol Cortez. Um, we love having readers and writers come from all over the state. And we just love these author, these very rich author talks. So this is recorded and this will be um, out in the world for people to rewatch or share in any way they like. Um, so thank you so much. And it was great having both of you. Yes, thank, thank you for you. inviting thank you. me. Thank you, David. And thank you, Blake, for, uh, for having me. And Cliff, uh, you're a mensch, Cliff. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, I, you know, I want to continue this conversation someday, so expect a call. Well, we'll, we'll do it over some Jack Daniels or something. Now you're talking, yes, or some Four Roses. 